Hey there, welcome to the Ryan Kingsline Show. My name's Ryan Kingsline, and in this podcast, we interview amazing artists, creatives, and creators to find out how they tick and how they got where they are today. So sit back, relax. I look forward to sharing their journey with you. All right, so it's Chris, right? Yes. All right, Chris Radsby. Tell me where you're working right now, man. And thank you so much for being here again. I know I already said that, but thanks again. No worries. I'm currently working for uh, Ubisoft Massive in Sweden. It's the developers of The Division. Awesome. And so you're in Sweden? Yeah, I am. About eight hours ahead of you guys. In the European market, is that something you find like there's a good bit of jobs there? Or is it scarce? Oh. Or is the talent scarce? Or how does that work? No, I would say there's a bunch of jobs over here. And expanding still, like the European game development scene has been doing really well. Really? That's great to hear. Yeah. Okay, for all the Europeans. All right, so we found you actually through some of your level 80 tutorials, which are just... Oh, I see. Yeah, just amazing. And uh, thank you so much for doing that stuff. The students really love that. Oh, that's good. That's good. It's like I kind of aim them for students and people who want to go into like indie stuff. So they feel like they can, you can make good art or nice looking art with limited means. Yeah. And, you know, that's actually kind of what I thought might be a good direction for our conversation, because one of the things I notice about your work is that you finish it, like you take it all the way. And some of these scenes that you do, you know, they could be massive. Yeah. There's a lot. Yeah. Yeah, Usually I I've always been the kind of type that ends up caring more about the big picture than details. Mm -hmm. I end up like making huge scenes generally. So how does that work, though? Let's say, for example, for somebody who wants to get the job you've got, they want to work on the division. They want to, they want to right. get it. One of the job, if not your job, then at least one of the jobs that's out there right now that is accessible to them. Depending on what you want to specialize in. I mean, obviously, if you want to be a props artist, you kind of have to know the latest and greatest techniques yeah. of getting like the most quality you can out of your props. But if you're more interested in storytelling and become like a, an environmental artist, like an environment artist, then generally you should focus on just making sure you can make really nice compositions and and see if you can infuse your art with some kind of story as well. I think it's really good, generally. But along those lines, how important is it for somebody to also focus on quality? And I ask that because, you know, if you look at environment jobs, it's kind of confusing right now to know exactly what that job is because there's surfacing. Right. And then props is kind of put in there with environment sometimes. And then there's environment arts, and then there's layout, and then there's, you know, so what are the kind of specialties that you'd recommend or that you see? If you want to go in and become like a texture artist, I feel it's kind of hard right now to only do like textures, like substance designer, because usually you have one or two substance guys at the office, right? Right. They do most of the stuff. Generally, if you want to get into the industry, as I see it right now, you kind of have Mm -hmm. to focus on either environments or props. There will always be like a need. For that kind of thing. How do we distinguish ourselves from the rest of the people out there? Well, first, you got to start making stuff that people aren't making, in my opinion. If you want to do like props art. Like, yeah, let's start with props. It's good to like follow tutorials and stuff to learn new workflows. But I've always yeah. thought it was, it's kind of bad when like a lot of people follow the same tutorial and then yes. end up with the same prop. Because right. for the recruiter, like cause it's not always your art ends up directly in the hands of like the art lead or someone. But for the recruiter to be able to distinguish between 50 props that looks the same between artists becomes really hard. Right. Generally. So distinguishing yourself with like trying to make stuff that's not super common or like actually do your thing. Like if, if you see someone make a prop, like maybe you go the extra mile and put it into its proper setting, do like a small, tiny little uh, diorama kind of thing, you know? Mm-hmm. I think uh, that's the easiest way of doing it. And for environments, a lot of students, juniors, they tend to, they get too caught up in the game art, you know, like, oh, I have mm-hmm. to make modules, you know, I have to make something yeah. super smart. But if you really want to distinguish yourself from others, then you really just need to focus on like the core art skills. If you can sell your scene with like that thumbnail on ArtStation, then you are really, you're in a good position already, I would say. Oh, that's great. What do you think are the core art skills? Like they could focus on color theory or composition or... Color theory and composition does a lot, actually. Just understanding like how you can frame things with color, you can add depth with color. It's not only like when people 
overused fog for one. Yes. Like, yes, it's uh, like a pet peeve of mine. Yeah, it just ends up bleaching the whole scene with that mm-hmm. gray filter that just goes into the distance. Like you can do that with color. There's so much more you can do. And if you take like the extra, if you go the extra mile and you just learn more about how to apply them, those techniques, your art will stand out, I would say. How much should we be focused on realism or stylized or how do we understand where we should go there? Because, you know, as a beginner, we don't know what games are being developed by companies per se. Some of that's known, some of it's secret. So I think maybe I just need to be as good as possible. So I'm going to, when I make a rock, I'm going to spend like a month on that rock and it's going to be a damn good rock. Yeah. I, (laughs) yeah, I always tell like when people ask me, I tell them to focus on realistic art because stylized art is really hard to just generally get a job with, in my opinion. Mm -hmm. And most of the bigger studios, they do like these big Hollywood blockbuster, realistic art style type things. Mm-hmm. So that's how it, like if you're if your focus is to like you want to get a job and you don't really maybe you don't really care what company then totally go for realistic it's easier but if you know that you want to work for like Blizzard or something then you really need to focus on like stylized but that only really sets you up for those types of stylized games right mm-hmm. yeah I've been thinking about that question a bit because I, you know I know for example Leticia Gillett who's a, a friend of mine's been in the industry for a bit and um. She worked at Blizzard and she went to school where I went to school and she was all her students or all her teachers would tell her, you know, you got to put something realistic in the portfolio. And she's like, I don't want to do any realistic work. (laughs) I hate it. So she did all stylized and she focused and that got her a job at Overwatch and then that got her a job. Now she's at DreamWorks. So, you know, you have to focus. But is it your opinion that the bulk of the jobs is really at least the, the most direct path is if you don't care, realistic work? Yes, I would say it is. Because the bigger companies tend to just like do realistic mostly. Like mm-hmm. stylized, you, it's really hard, in my opinion, to distinguish yourself in stylized because you just have to be really good at stylized. I'm doing stylized because I've been working in the industry for a long time and I have the privilege of doing stylized because I find it fun. And don't make my stylized with the like the thinking that I am going to land a job. You know, that's just for me, you know. Mm-hmm. But in the end, like if you're passionate about stylized stuff, then go for that, I guess. But like if you if you if you want, it's good to it's definitely good to have like be able to do realistic stuff, and it's easier it's, these days as well. Like Substance Painter yeah, makes yeah. things easier to do realistic stuff. We had to fight so hard to even do deal with like metals and stuff back in the day when there was only like specular maps and gloss maps. Mm-hmm. But yeah, realistic probably the way to go. Riley's asking an interesting question about whether or not um, that will continue or not. And um, one of the things that it kind of fuels that, of course, is uh, I think it's Stadia, Google's platform with the 10 Mm -hmm. teraflops. That's going to ideally, who knows, there's a lot in the execution, but that's going to ideally open up the bandwidth, right? So let's say, for example, you know, if I want to play a game right now, Mm -hmm. most games are either console or on the PC. Right. If I want to maybe... I have a PC in the studio and I have a Mac in the house. So if I want to play something with my kids, you know, is it cross-platform? There's a million different problems involved in all of that stuff. And a lot of it has to do with just hardware issues and teams developing for, for example, one of the games I love, uh, War Tile. It only does PC because they only have three developers. So if they develop for Mac and now they've got multiple test case scenarios they have to deal with, big pain in the butt. So they don't. Right. Stadia, Stadia might change that, right? Right. Yeah, exactly. It might open. I mean, from what I've seen, it seems very promising. The only problem would be people's bandwidth. But it really does open up a whole lot of opportunities when, when hardware no longer really becomes like the issue mm-hmm. uh, in that sense. So that, that's quite interesting. Or yeah, and cross-platform stuff as well. Yeah, uh, I remember... In their demo where they went from the PC to the, they just went from one device to another device and it all worked. It only, yeah, it's just streaming video and inputs, right? So I, I mean, I feel like that it's, it's going to be very promising generally. You might not see it like for a lot of competitive games and stuff, but it's mm-hmm. definitely promising for all kinds of like other games. I think they showcase like assassins or something. Yeah. Uh, and it seems pretty valuable f- for that kind of thing, I think. What about artificial intelligence? Some of the crazy stuff going on there. Like, right. have you seen the, the Codex avatars by Facebook that just, they make 
basically make your face. I haven't actually. That's quite Unreal. interesting. Yeah, but then yeah. with artificial intelligence dealing with procedural art and with substance already being procedural, mm -hmm. what do we do? I think you just have to become more technical. <laughs> yeah, there's always someone who has to author everything. Mm -hmm. It's just new ways of working. It's just doing the work for you. I don't know if you've seen like Andrew uh, Maximov's uh, Prometheus AI, or it's like, I think it's he's working on I'm not sure what you, it would be a plugin or like, it's like infused into Unreal. And he's like telling the AI to like, please make me an 80s style room. And it just generates an 80s style room with all the props and layout. Like, no, I want it to be neat, not messy. <laughs> and then it just cleans everything up and adds all the props based on the rules that he set up. Right. It's so like, it's doing all the things so that you can, you spend less time moving around the gizmo, right? So that you can spend the time actually creating, which will open a lot of doors if it's actually becoming the workflow for the future. Because that means like maybe your narrative designer guy could do all the level art or environment art propping for you or for himself, you know? Mm -hmm. And it's uh, it's quite interesting, that thing. It's a bit scary. We'd all lose our jobs. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but I, I don't know, you gotta, like more and more things becoming procedural. So you kind of just it, it sucks a bit, but you have to become more technical and get used to it. Like, and, and Substance Designer is a good like launching platform to get used to like working with node-based systems and all of that stuff. You get like that basic understanding of of like how you would deal with shader networks as well, mm -hmm. and like how you because a lot of visual node stuff happens in like scripting as well, right? In like Unreal and in 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 other AAA studios game engines as well, like where they script stuff, they have dialogue trees and everything, and all that kind of is kind of connected in the same way. So you kind of get used to it. That makes sense, actually. So if I understand you correctly, you're saying, basically, you need to learn how to talk to this stuff, talk to the AI, which will most likely in the beginning not be natural language, but it'll be some sort of nodal-based system that you have to interface with. Probably. Like, set up just complex set of rules. Even if it's just not straight up code, it'll probably be like, like a hierarchy of like a dialogue tree, like if this yeah. happens, this is inputs comes in, you have to figure out like how to generate the rules. It's becoming more and more prominent in, in game development today, I think. Yeah. Well, let's get yeah. back to the art because I think the other thing that's really relevant there is, is if you don't have an idea and if you don't have a story and if you don't know the foundations of art, AI is unlikely to solve that stuff for you. So what are some of the tips, some of the, the ways that you think about story in an environment? Like for example, the one we're looking at right now or the, the 70s one that you did. How much story? How do you write the story? What kind of story? I usually start by listening to music. This is something I do. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I close my eyes. I find a good soundtrack. Generally, I just go like, I know what kind of scene I want to work on, or like what kind of setting. And then I find music. And then I just close my eyes and and like I start making in my head what I, I just figure out like the, the, the minimum of the story in my head or what to do. I remember when I did that, uh, like sci-fi scene where the, like the ship is flying over my scene. I was just listening to Mass Effect soundtrack, and and that just popped in. Like I just wanted to show, I wanted to show epic scale, I wanted to show different colors, and I wanted to uh, fill my like environment with some kind of life, some kind of swooping motion, and that ended up just being that ship that comes flying through my scene. So yeah, I mean, uh, any story you can infuse your scene with is better than no story, in my opinion. But if you, gives, if you don't mind. Um, I want to kind of see if I can unpack that a little bit, because for me, I, the devil's always in the details. So when you say you have in mind the setting, how's that framed in your mind? Is it like desert landscape? You said epic scale. Is Do you know in advance that you're like, I'm going to do a forest scene? I do. Like I, I tend to break it down to like super small things. I imagine a main color first. Like I imagine, I mean, like for that scene, I imagined orange. Okay. And then I, in my head, I saw a tower. And it was orange and tower. For a long time, it was orange and just a tower. And then I started developing the scene from there. So I tend to like use main focal point, tower, mm -hmm. main color, orange. Okay, got it. You know? And then I start adding to it, like what leads up to the tower uh -huh. and what are like the, the complement colors or the contrast colors to the scene and start adding another main color that complements it. Or uh, So I go very basic when I first start something. Got it. You know, one of the things, especially with environment, that got me thinking recently, recently I've been just diving into this a bit more. If we're like looks, looking at, um, I don't know, maybe landscape painting, or even if you're looking at like concept, you get something from like 
uh, Mondragiev, you know, one of the cinematic concept artists, you know, mm-hmm. and their job is just to showcase something cool in the scene. But in a in a game, an environment isn't just a landscape. It it's people. Somebody has to move through it. There right. has to be a purpose and a place and a destination. And how does that affect your creation process? Do you think about uh, that, or or does it not affect it at all? I tend to think about it. I mean, not I like I put it lower on my like in priorities Mm -hmm. generally like i don't like these days i don't really approach my art with games in mind which is it might sound weird but i do game art but i try to look at more i try to frame my own stuff like paintings Mm -hmm. i also don't look at concept art with characters in it because concept art with characters in it are all focused on the character and not the world right yeah. So, and a lot of people end up like, oh, this is a cool concept art. And then they make the scene, but then they miss the whole point because the, <laughs> the character yeah. was the focus, you know, I and without the character, it just looks not very interesting. So yeah, I tend to, whenever I browse concept art, even if they have a character on it, I tend to pop the character away in my head and see, does the scene actually work without the character? Right. That's so, a fantastic I mean, that, point. Yeah. That's something I, I tend to do. And, uh, Oh, yeah, I also I also value my like when I go through concept art and reference, I tend to look at the concept art and see I start counting like the individual elements. Mm-hmm. Okay, so this has like five unique rocks. It has like ten different buildings. You know, they're using widely different materials. And then I'll come up with like, okay, so how would this actually take? How long would this take to produce? Six months. Okay, that's too much. You know, so then I start like finding other concept art or reference that actually suits like my timeline more one month two months because it's it's super easy to use pick the wrong concept and then you end up just shooting yourself in the foot because the scene won't look good without all of these 50 unique elements in it and then it's that's why people like most people don't end up finishing their scenes Yep. Because of this reason. It's not their fault. It's just too much work for one person to consistently work on for, for six months. Like you, you have to be really dedicated to be able to do that. And for people learning, that's actually detrimental to their learning process, in my opinion. Mm-hmm. It's better for them to quick fire environments or dioramas where they, they feel like they achieve something quickly and then learn more stuff that they can apply to the next scene instead of spending six months on one huge one. Yeah. And along those lines, how many people usually work on on a scene in the teams that you've been part of? It depends. The games, like I worked on Far Cry 3 and on that mm-hmm. one where we were making like levels, it would be one level or one environment artist per level in mm-hmm. that one. But then you also had, you had a, a prop team making all the props for you. So you would put in that's the a, test. Yeah, that's a big deal <laughs> right there. So like you wouldn't, you'd focus only on the compositional elements, the flow through the level. And mm-hmm. like how it played together with the level designer, right? So, and if that, if that's what you want to do, then downloading stuff from the internet, doing you like grabbing UE4 marketplace assets is totally fine because your uh, intention is to only like tell stories through the environment and show like how good you are at like composition and flow through an environment and stuff. Then that's totally fine. How does that work for getting a job and for your portfolio? Generally, I would say it's you need to know how to make props. Yeah, But at some point when you've shown that you can make them, like if I see already like you have like high poly, like really nice looking guns or really nice looking assets, like Mm -hmm. whatever, sci-fi radio, there's a limit in how much you need to show because you've already shown that you can make it. And then then if you wanted to go more into environment art, then you can focus on just making environments. Like my environments I'm currently working on, I have one tree and five rocks in it. Right. So yes, like you, you can do a lot with few assets, in my opinion, if you mm-hmm. use them right, right? Yeah, but do you think that it's important for an environment artist to have that kind of prop level skill? Like be able, not necessarily at the best level of prop artist, because, you know, you can dive into that when somebody starts focusing on specific usage and where and really building the authenticity of a piece. But do you think it's still important, even if you want to be an environment artist that's focused more on the composition and the arrangement side, layout side is, I think, what you'd say? I think you need to show that you can do it yourself. It's good if it's the best level it can be. Mm -hmm. But if you want to get a job, you have to get it to junior level. And that's, unfortunately, it's quite high these days because there's like games are bigger than ever. 
but the tools are much better than they used to be. So getting there is easier than it was before, in my opinion. But yeah, you definitely need to show, like you need to be able to like show that you can make your own textures. You know your way around Substance Designer, but nobody's expecting you to be like Josh Lynch or the best. Right. But you need to be able to show that you can do it. And then it's yeah. also about the focus, right? Like if, if you want to be an environment artist, you also, yeah, you need to show that you can make environments. Got it. So on a portfolio, a couple of prompts you did, then if you put together a scene that maybe has marketplace assets or stuff like that, then you're just showcasing a different skill. Yes, exactly. Because I mean, a lot of times there are a bunch of artists that are just like set dressing only. Ubisoft has, we, they, we call it level artists, right? And like their uh -huh. focus is mainly set dressing. Yeah. You know, so then you really need to be able to be really good at just, okay, figuring out the logic of the place that you're working in, be able to make small compositional compelling stories, like environmental storytelling mm -hmm. for those spaces. And like, that's a whole skill in itself to make that work together with gameplay and stuff. It makes it like, can be pretty intricate sometimes. Is that something where they have the assets given to them or they have to build the assets and then dress the set? Oh, in the art test. Yeah. I've seen both. They would be like, oh, you should build your own assets. Or I've even have, I've even made art tests that are like, they, that the, where the employer didn't care if I was making the assets or if I downloaded the assets off the internet. Mm -hmm. I did, they, they, their, uh, intention was just to judge my sense of being able to set dress a scene. Got it. That makes sense. And about art tests. I like mm -hmm. to ask this of everybody to get a sense of how people perceive this. Cause you know, you'll often read mostly from people outside the industry or people who are kind of on the way out. You, this argument that this industry is the only one that does art tests, like where you have to prove that you can do, you basically have to do the work before they will, are even remotely willing to pay you or even engage you in a conversation to pay you. Right. About it. So it can seem quite daunting, right? But I remember one of my friends, Melissa Albello, who had, she did two art tests for right. Sucker Punch Studio. And mm -hmm. this was after she worked for a decade at Naughty Dog, like a yeah. decade at yeah. one of the leading game companies. And you'd think if anybody was safe, Melissa would be safe, but she's not safe. Two art yeah, tests. Yeah, it happens. It's sad, but it does happen. Like when they don't have anything that they can show, mm -hmm. like even... Personal work. Like not, not like no personal work. And even mm -hmm. like if, if they show, sure, you worked on Uncharted or something, you know, and then, but like it's, it's always like uh, this huge level and it was made by me and 20 other people. Then it's just, right. it's very hard. I haven't really heard about anyone lately having to do artists mm -hmm. if they're experienced, but I guess I'm guess I I'm not that involved in that. I mean, I know that uh, uh, students get art tested all the time. What do you think is an important? I'm going to say it's in a simple way, and then I'll break it down. But what do you think is an important thing for people to have in the portfolio? And what I mean by that is one of the things that we do in the boot camp. One of the beliefs I have, anyways, is that you know it's not important for you to kind of master everything because for me, that's just, that's not, yeah. you, once, you, once you go deep, you realize there's deeper to go. Oh, yeah. You know? yeah. yeah. So mastery is a, it's a, it's an odd conversation. But what is important is that you need to hit the triggers or the kind of evolutions that people need to see you go through. So for example, in character art, for example, anatomy is relevant, but it's not everything. Mm -hmm. Next mm -hmm. thing is, can they pull together an entire character and get it out of ZBrush and use substance and get it into Marmoset? Like, that's just the first evolution, in my opinion. Can you complete right. an actual character? If you can't do that, I kind of don't care how much you can sculpt because sculpting is just a small part of the game, of the process, right? Right. So what do you think people need to have in their portfolio? Let's say they want to be an environment artist, not just props, but they want to be an environment artist. They might start at props. I mean, gladly take mm -hmm. the job, but they want to show themselves, what do they need to have? Like, What are the, the artistic triggers that tell you somebody's ready for this job so what's really impressive generally is like i tend to judge people by a couple of different categories because we've hired people that have made one good environment like he, the dude had one environment yeah but it was so well made it wasn't like the best quality environment but he did everything right he did all the props like he utilized several techniques he got it working for vr you know he did the lighting, the particles, the gameplay, you know, he just made everything. So you're like, this is a guy who can complete it, every aspect of the thing. 
you know, he has an understanding of game development. And that's a very hireable trait. And then you have people like, I tend to judge them about like, well, both me and my lead, like their artistic skill. Like you can, you don't need to be a master of sculpting or texturing or anything, but like you can show like artistic skill. Mm -hmm. Then that's also a very hireable trait because not a lot of people are super strong in just that, right? And then you have just execution, I guess. Just like people are really skilled at just sculpting or detailing. Like I, I, we have this one guy at the office that's just, he's great at like putting his head down and putting every tiny detail to a thing, right? He might not be the best guy to have like in a team to make a, you know, like a, a, a big mission where you have to go talk to all these people in different departments to get it done. Right. But like you can give him a task and like, I need you to focus this. And he just does, you know, such a great job just figuring out every little detail about that thing. So there, there are a couple of things you can excel on. I think if, if you're looking for something like trying to become good at what, what matches your personality type. So what matches my personality type is like, I don't like detailing. So I end up focusing on the big stroke stuff, you know, mm -hmm. colors, composition, you know, I reuse a lot of stuff like that Wild West scene you had in the introduction, the one I made, like the Wild mm -hmm. West one, that's like 90% of that are stock textures from Unreal. Mm -hmm. And you can still make a great looking thing or in storytelling and still use the stock textures that Unreal actually is providing you. What are some of the things that you see in the work that tell you this person's just not a candidate? Hmm, that's a tricky one. Uh, mm -hmm. Inconsistency is tricky. Okay. And it's very uh, rough on students because they're learning at such a rapid pace right. that they want to show off everything they've learned during their studies, like one year, two years or whatever. Mm -hmm. But the quality is vastly different between each piece. Right. Not everybody has an understanding. Like the recruiter, they might not know if it's inconsistent or if this person is just good at different styles or, or learning. So it's like at some point you kind of want to say goodbye to your older stuff and just cut the cord kind of thing. Yeah. So inconsistency is a big thing. Yeah. You got to like, like your taste as well. It's a big deal. And I, I get, it ties into like artistic sense, I think. So you kind of want to like, if you're not sure, you kind of just have to ask your your peers or a mentor about what they think about your artistic skill, because maybe you're just not combining the colors. It like it makes it non pleasing to the eye or something, and you maybe you don't see that yourself. Mm -hmm. Sometimes you just need some other input, some feedback to be able to like figure that out. And taste that grows with time. Like it's not really anybody's fault. That's just you have to learn what works. That's just experience generally. Yeah. That makes a lot of sense. And I want to talk about that, the question of where you get taste. But before I get into that, it's a tough one, especially for people beginning. They want to show they've got a lot of work. So that introduces the potential for inconsistency. Mm -hmm. One of the things I've noticed, I don't know if this isn't as true for environment artists, but for character art, you know, it can be that environment art can take a long time. Character art can take a long time. But mm -hmm. for example, one of my um, students, Niles, he, he came, just came in for one class. But Niles Rush worked on one character six months, nearly went crazy, mm -hmm. built an unbelievable piece, like just an amazing piece built on the Witcher in the Witcher right. world. And uh, it was just ungodly, but, but not just in sculpt. It was also textured. It was also in the game engine. Oh, and awesome. uh, he went in for an interview at the uh, motion picture company, MPC, over there in the UK. Mm -hmm. They looked at that one work. They hired him on the spot. They didn't look at another one of his works. Yeah, that can happen so, totally. Okay, so the question is, how many pieces does somebody need to have? Should we be focused on quantity or should we be focused on quality? How do we quality, thread that needle? Quality is the most important, I think. Because like I said before, people have been hired on just the one environment. You won't get hired on one prop. But if you, you, like, if you have one environment that's like consistent in quality and really well made and executed, that would be uh, enough, in my opinion. Okay. How do we develop our taste, our palate, so to speak? What do you do? And I was also wondering, like, how you search for music that inspires you as well, you know, because a lot of us are kind of off in our own little planet. You know, we're just doing this from our computer and interfacing with the world. Right. You know, how, how do we develop talent? Are we looking at the comics that we used to look at? Do we hit some French Belgian comics? <laughs> <You know? laughs> how do we develop our vocabulary on this? Yeah, you can only really, like at the start, yeah, at least you can only really go for uh, what you yourself like and what inspires you. I tend to 
try and be versatile and like move around and like I go between realistic and stylized and different settings because it's good to have that range. And during the years, I've picked up uh, composers that I just prefer. Like uh, I have this one guy, composer uh, Macon is his uh, username on like Polycount, I think. And he's always inspired me with his music. And for a long time, I was I used to just make pieces, art pieces from from his music alone. Mm. So, I mean, whatever inspires you, I think, uh, I don't know, music I've always preferred because it's just, it's easier to close my eyes and imagine something. Mm-hmm. Even if it's just a, if it's a sense of something, even if it's just a feeling, it helps me. Because if I don't do that, I end up, I easily get stuck in doing just whatever everybody else is doing. You know, I'm going to make a sci-fi corridor. Right. <laughs> you know, it's not very yeah. inspiring. You know, it's yeah. not very, it doesn't come from, from inside. You know, it's hard, mm-hmm. it's hard for me to get passionate about. So that's kind of what I'm doing. A lot of my art and my style and what I, I try to go for is probably just because of the games I played in the past, right? What I like, like I like Zelda and Ocarina of Time. Yeah. You know, it's uh, all of that inspired, like tranquil environments mm-hmm. always inspired me. So that my art just reflects that now. Yeah, like um, the scene we're looking at right now is very tranquil. Yeah, exactly. It's just like non-noisy environments with colorful textures and colors. You know, it's it's uh, just what I prefer right now. Uh, Where do you find the music? SoundCloud, is that what it's called? Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. There, mostly. And YouTube, I guess. But mostly it's SoundCloud. Like a- and organize it after I want electronic mm-hmm. yeah. rock music. Then you can like you can sort it out, and then you just, I go through. I, I'm like when I start a project, I tend to use. Okay, I'm gonna spend two nights just mm-hmm. looking up music or like listening to music. Yeah. You know, I don't try to stress it too much. I'm just like okay, gonna find something that inspires me, and then I go like that. Because I get I get everything from music. I get setting, I get colors, I get mm-hmm. like the general feel and everything. So that's what I tend to do. Do you tend to listen to it on repeat or? Listen to a yeah, whole album repeat. of it. It happens, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> repeat or finding music with similar style and then listening yeah. to like the, their whole album or something. I found uh, listening to music on repeat like oddly focusing. Not, it's just incredibly focusing for me. Yeah, I do that I all the time. I also have. I, I'm a strong believer in in conditioning yourself. So I, when I want to work, I have mm-hmm. a playlist that is like work mode. Ah, yeah. Because the, some of the hardest barriers for artists is to get into that creative flow. Totally. And if you condition yourself to always listen to like the same type of music when you need to get into flow, like it helps to just put you over into the zone, in my opinion. Uh, so I tend to do that. So I like on Spotify, I have my different lists for what I need to do or like for when I need to work. No, oh, that makes a lot of sense. The other day, my um, kids were doing the homework and my wife turned on Mozart and my mm. daughter, my daughter is just, she's just a interesting creature but she's like mom i can't focus with this mozart can you put um and then she gave the name of this other band which sounded like dokken from way way back in my day and it was all a headbanger metal right and my daughter's <laughs> like eight years old and so i walk out into the room and there's like head banging metal on and my my daughter and my son are both doing math homework and my wife's just walking around like she asked for it yeah, you know, you like what you like. <laughs> you can't yeah. help it. <laughs> <laughs> so crazy. I was like, I don't, I don't know if this is good parenting or, but you know, they're doing homework. They're doing math. Yes, uh, I mean, it works. You know, <laughs> it works. <laughs> okay, so when developing taste, are you mm-hmm. looking to get noticed as well as get a job, or is this coming from internal, or are we thinking about how to sell it? And what advice do you have? You know, I know most of us were artists, so we're actually we're not really. You know, we're not here trying to sell ourselves, like maybe if we were in marketing or something like that. Right. No, you I, know? yeah, yeah. I've, I've played that angle and it's been hugely successful. <laughs> it's sad to say, but like, I've been on the cover of Substance yeah. for the summer edition. Yeah. And that whole scene, I made that with the intention of being different and like selling. Yes. It's weird, but I, the main shot of it is a vertical shot. Mm-hmm. And there are very few artworks on ArtStation that are vertical in the 3D scene. So just doing that puts you ahead a lot because you're doing something that is different. It's very common in concept art, but yes. it's very hard to do vertical art in using like Unreal because you to do it properly, you have to twist your monitor around. And I have mm-hmm. two monitors and I buy monitors that can rotate. Okay. 
So I put one viewport on one monitor, right? I rotate the whole monitor and then set the settings for a vertical shot to work. Right. And then I work on my right monitor where it's like regular widescreen. Yes. So like if you want to try and try different compositions, yeah. it might be worth just looking into like try a vertical composition. Okay, got it. So we started out this conversation of how do you thread the needle and you and you basically said, don't just sell. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, sorry. I <laughs> uh, no, but it's like thinking about what puts you ahead of the competition is, I get is it, basically yeah. the point of it. In that case, it's like just figuring out what's different because you kind of you get these like you you get so used to seeing the same type of artwork on art station. Yes. So figuring out what like don't necessarily do what's popular, or like if you want to do what's popular, then try to put some unique twist to it whatever it might be. I think it's good to spend quite some time thinking about what you're going to do, what you're like, like the planning stage before you even get to making something is actually worth thinking about and analyzing because you're investing in a project that could take you six months for you to spend a week or two just thinking about what you want to do, colors, reference, compositions, what inspires you is totally worth doing before actually investing six months in a project. How do you plan a scene? I tend to, I mean, even at this, like I have my faces, production mm-hmm. stages, and I tend to, if I'm doing my own design, then I put up, I divide all my reference into atmospheric reference and then okay. uh, prop reference. And I even do like, I even do compositional reference. Like I tend to draw a lot of my inspiration from movies, cinematography, Mm-hmm. that doesn't necessarily relate to the setting I'm making. Because a good composition is a good composition, whether it's a Wild West or it's a fantasy setting. Right, totally. You know, so that skill, that kind of thing is transferable. So when you're looking for reference for composition, you can look at anything. It doesn't matter. Like you need to get out of the, your head and be like, I need to find something that looks exactly like what I'm doing. You don't need that. You just need to figure out like, I heard this movie or this concept artist does great compositions. Then you can pull from that. You don't have to find the correct setting or the correct style even. Okay, great. So I think I want to pivot now and chat a little bit about the technical side of this, and especially when you're developing environments. So you mentioned, you know, like we'll, we'll assume somebody's, we, we know somebody needs to be reasonably competent at developing props. Not reasonably, right. they need to be pretty much good at this point at developing props and building the assets in a timely fashion with the modern tools. But when we get into building the environments, how important is the lighting? How much do we need to have that kind of optimized? Like, should we be worrying about light maps and baking all that stuff, dynamic lights? Like, what extent should we be focused on the technical side of this? I think for when it comes to game art, you mm-hmm. need to be aware of what is performant and not performant. Yeah. But your art doesn't necessarily have to reflect that. Got it. Because it's better you take the time and put the extra polygons on your spheres or mm-hmm. like your tubes, right, to get it to look really good and not so, you know, faceted or pushing the lighting settings to max for your final render, right? That's totally fine. You just need to show as well that you're like actually aware because your art, the quality of your art and how good your art is will get you the interview. And at the interview, you can tell them about all your knowledge about game development. Because you'll get questions like, how would you handle this situation? And then if you can tell them how you would handle it with all performance, Mm -hmm. different techniques in mind, then you can tell them there. You don't really have to show all of that in your portfolio. When I started, showing LODs and everything was super important in your portfolio. That You don't really see that anymore because lots of AAA studios use Simply Gone now, which automatically LODs all your assets, right? It's good to know. It's good to know how to make manual LODs for one, but like it's not really necessary anymore. You just need to know about it. Mm -hmm. It's better that you focus on making good art because that's the stuff. If your art is good, it'll get sent around the office. Mm. That's what we want. Yeah. What about effects and motion, right? Like we've got the grass moving, you've got clouds moving. Right. Yeah, that's the luxury. You have to be interested in all areas. It's not necessary at all that you know about shaders how to make complex particles or anything. Mm. You don't really have to. It's good to show that you tried it out. For me, it's just a means for me to make my scenes more lively. But yeah, I don't think you need to know, but it's good to know. 
Got it. And then in terms of the actual uh, skill set for an environmental artist, there's, there's a lot. There's foliage, tree mm-hmm. modeling, rocks. Mm-hmm. You know, then if you we were talking about sci-fi quarters, that introduces trim sheets. I mean, trim sheets can be anywhere, but right. it introduces trim sheets, modularity for hallways and and, right. and uh, stuff like that. So there's a lot. Is there a should somebody focus on a particular th- area? Like, let's say, focus on exterior medieval scenes. Is there a big division between the people that focus on that versus people who are like, hey, I'm going for Halo. We're doing all sci-fi. It doesn't really matter what setting you do. I mean, it's always good to go with what's popular. There's a pro and con of like trying to replicate the style of the company you're trying to get hired by. Mm-hmm. Because if your art is actually lots a lot worse than they make, then it becomes a problem. Then they're like actively compare their game to your art. Right. And if you're not up to par, then you're in a tricky situation. Right. You know. There's actually a staggering amount of artists that learn on the job. I never used to do foliage before. Mm-hmm. I learned that on the job. I didn't really know how to make foliage when I got a job. You know, that's just, oh, artist, foliage, cool. Let's, let's spend a couple of days learning all about foliage. <laughs> you know, <laughs> right. It's, uh, <laughs> it's just part. You don't have to know everything. It's good to have dabbled in a little bit of everything, but it's also like, it's a little bit of a trap trying to like, become a vegetation artist because yeah sure that's great and it's very sought after you know but they're also like making guns as well we, like most companies already have a gun guy it's better if you're actually more versatile in my mm-hmm. opinion all right chris thank you so much let me open this up for questions if you guys have any questions now's a great time to post them up do i have any boot campers in here so mr bobo is asking what's your favorite movie when it comes to compositions it's tricky. Uh, landscape stuff is probably what's that movie called? The Revenant. Mm. Because the character isn't necessarily the focus in that movie. He is the focus, but it's like they show so much of the environment that's breathtaking by itself. Yeah. Which is why I like it. But yeah, I mean, it's only like now when I've become more experienced that I've started to actually appreciate movies more and making art that actually has the one frame focus, you know. It's yeah. better. It's like, it's generally, it's easier for the workflow to focus on the one frame. And also you produce better art if you get into that. Cool. All right. Brian's asking, is it important to show your process in your final or in your portfolio pieces or keep that hidden? The processes today are pretty standard. Like they're standardized. So like, unless you're making something vastly different, there's no need. If you're making something vastly different, then you should show your process because you should be proud of it. But if you're making guns or cars the same way everybody else is, then there's no there's no reason to, in my opinion. What about the tutorials that you've done at level 80? Do you think it's, does it help your career or somebody's career boost their profile, help them get a job or any of that stuff, doing stuff like that? I think it's definitely worth doing articles. Uh, it's something you put on your resume it's something that helps you, like if you're a European and trying to get young in the States, showing that you're actually like you're trying to be part of this field. Yeah, it's always a good thing to get more exposure in that sense. Mm-hmm. Did you see any kind of bump from, I mean, you, you were highlighted by substance algorithmic, so that in and of itself is a pretty big deal. Right. So does that change the kind of job offers that you get or, or not? It does, yeah. Exposure is always good. <laughs> you you know, it's been great and I love it, but it's it hasn't really gotten me like a, a lot of job offers or anything like that. Mm-hmm. It's, it's no. a privilege to be doing s- such a simple style and be or have been part of like the substance uh, splash images. It's, it's really cool. So Yaz is asking, um, he's at an indie studios on a, it's very stylized, and but he wants mm-hmm. to work in a AAA um, right. after it ships. So mm-hmm. is the stylized still relevant? Should he put it on his portfolio or in his application? Oh, yeah, for sure. Because uh, like every production knowledge is great to have on there. Uh, showing that you can work in a team and you can deliver, that's super important. Like even if you come from movies and want to work in games, that's super awesome to have that stuff in. Ryan's asking, um, is there any environments that are currently kind of overdone? Anything in environments that's really just overdone, such as sci-fi corridor? Yes, sci-fi corridors are overdone. 
but it's not because they're a sci-fi corridor. It's because everybody don't think further mm. than a corridor. Mm-hmm. I, like every time I bring up or talk about sci-fi corridors, I look at point at like Deus Ex or something because they have sci-fi corridors, but they're like pushing shape language. They have different materials on the walls. They're like mixing metal, wood, concrete. Like it looks amazing. They have patterns. Mm-hmm. They have floors that are super intricate. They have ceilings that are super intricate and cool. So like if you want to do a sci-fi corridor, you kind of have to like, again, how do you elevate it further than, than just the corridor, you know? Right. And not like, oh, I, I'm going to have a window on the left side and create some asymmetry. How can you push it for like use, use different. It's like when Paul Pepera started using, when he started uh, using like cloth and stuff in his artwork for the sci-fi yeah. stuff. And it was just blew everybody's mind. And now you see it, like you see it in sci-fi games today. No, he's just, he made a trend, you know? Mm-hmm. So it's like, okay, mixing like sci-fi stuff with cloth. That was just, it was great. You see it in like Anthem, how they like wrap the, the guns in cloth and stuff. It's, it's like really cool. So you kind of just try and think outside the box, even if it might take you weird places, you know? <laughs> yeah, that's great. Yeah, because I remember that Paul just, I mean, that so beautiful at work. Right, right. It, it so was amazing. Sense. It doesn't necessarily make sense and you're hiding all the intricate detail or whatever, but that's also mm-hmm. part of it, right? Like it mm-hmm. made it made it so that you could have it like re, it highlighted the intricate detail in other areas. And you had that stark contrast between the, the different materials and how they felt in the render and everything. It was so good, amazing and inspiring work. What about software? Because there's substance designer, substance painter are the big boys out there. Quixel was first, but, you know, and now they're coming out with different things. And then there's Mm -hmm. Alchemist. How important is it? Should we be focused on one individual software because we only have so much time to learn this stuff? Or should we learn both? What do you think? Uh, I think generally skills are transferable. Mm -hmm. Generally, so you only have to learn one software, in my opinion. Like you learn, you take a texturing software, take substance, you learn substance. You spend time in the one 3D modeler package you know you don't have to learn all three or four or whatever yeah just focus on the one because all those skills are transferable it's just a tool right you just get used to doing things differently in different tools it's like when you had to choose between modbox or zbrush you can still sculpt you know they're still sculpting characters and anatomy and all that right so yeah yeah okay dirk is asking Mainly focus on material studies and doing quick blockouts of environments, but haven't finished one fully textured. Will it be valuable to post these scenes on ArtStation in, within the portfolio, not just the blog? Uh, yeah, okay. So yeah, having studies in your portfolio. Right. I've never minded that kind of thing. And also, Dirk, if it's Dirk from, from the Dynasty Discord, then his stuff is amazing. Like, cause he, he takes the extra, like you look at the, the composition, the time, like the artistic sense behind his work is really high. So it doesn't really matter if it's just, a, it's a block out, you know, because it looks really good. He makes texture. He made this, I think it was the catacombs, you know, in France, like he just made a texture with a bunch of skulls and stuff. But then he took like the time trying to like put it in its setting. So he like lit it and it had some animations of like creatures and shadows going on it. So it looked really spooky. But in the end, it's just it's just the texture with the shadows and uh, like some small animation. But he really just you get a sense for the whole like you can imagine what's behind the camera, kind of you know. It's really cool, and I, I've always enjoyed that. If you want, if you focus on textures, then uh, making a small little scene or a setting for it is it's great, and it's something that I would say uh, most material artists should do instead of just doing the the balls, right? The material right. balls, right? Awesome. And along these lines, like how. Is there a job out there for, because this is kind of a surfacing job, correct? Mm-hmm. The, uh, the substance job for the most part. Yes. So is this a job that you see out there very prevalent, maybe more so than the full environment job? Or I think, as you said earlier, most studios usually have a substance guy. We have a substance guy, right. But the problems in studios now is that they don't have a problem finding people who know how to do substances. They have a hard time finding people who have made substances for production. Nah. No. Stuff that is proven to work. You can make textures, but there's a very huge difference from making a bunch of different materials than to make a complete set of materials. So like, if you know you're going to make a desert, then you go like, make a desert biome, like you make 10 different desert textures that blend well all with them. And they're like, that's a big difference. It, like, 
setting that stuff up because that's more production focused. You have to think, how are all these textures I'm making going to work and interact with each other? How do they blend? How do they tile? How are we going to paint the mask that blends all of these, right? Mm -hmm. And there are a couple on ArtStation, uh, experienced artists that make sets, right? They start like making complete, like I'm, I'm going to make Iceland, right? And they make a whole complete set texture set for Iceland, like the greener grass, you know, the cliffs and the, the rocks and stone and all of that, and then puts it together in a small environment. That's really valuable because then you can see how all the textures actually interact with each other in the scene. It's much more interesting that way because you can't really tell that much from a material ball. You don't can't tell how it tiles. You can't tell how, we'll, how it works in a, in a huge environment. Got it. Looking at Josh's stuff is actually really, because you can see him like, oh, the stuff he did for Shadow of War, like he has a bunch of his material balls, right? And then he also has screenshots about like, this is how they're used in the environment. Mm -hmm. Super valuable. Cool. All right. Time for one more question. And then is it possible to get your eyes on somebody's work? Yeah, for sure. Okay. So Sari so had a question I think that might be quite useful to get from you. She was mentioning, asking how you deal with procrastination. I plan mine. Plan your procrastination? <laughs> yeah. Nice. Tell I, me more. I plan everything these days. I'm super busy. <laughs> <laughs> I, we're not super human, you know. Uh -huh. We need to relax. However, so I tend to plan my relaxation time. I have dedicated hours when I work and I only do work and don't want to be bothered, which is why I have the playlist to get into work mode. Mm -hmm. And then I have gaming time when I game and relax. So I plan mine. Even for students, I would recommend this because Sometimes you learn more from all actually doing other things and analyzing about what you're about to do and what you have done and yeah. what you can do better than actually just forcing yourself to do stuff all the time. You don't have to be a master sculptor that takes years, way longer than your time as a student or trying to get a job. So just focusing about like, what do I have to learn? What are my weaknesses? And try to like correct those is sometimes more valuable. Like I've grown. I think I've grown more from just thinking about what I need to be become better at and need to improve in my art than I have spent actually making my art. So that so I plan mine. I plan mine for sure. Plan relaxation time. It's super important. Awesome. That's great. All right, I'm going to switch the screen over to mine. And uh, okay, so we got a student's work here, Kyle. All right. Cool. And uh, Kyle, I'm imagining you want the the last one, the Victorian scene. Most of these are build ups into this Victorian scene, so. I really like the varied props in here. Mm -hmm. But what immediately strikes me is the fact that the room is a square. Mm. Like it has two windows, right? Or like two sides with the windows on it. Mm -hmm. That says it's a corner building, right? Or like a corner of the building. And you can, if you just, you could, could have potentially made it more interesting if you just cut the corner in the center of the frame and just, Maybe that's supposed like to be the start of a balcony outside or something because you set yourself up a little bit for failure when you just when your structure like the structure of the room is just completely a square. You know, mm -hmm. there's nothing wrong with the lighting and the props itself; those are all great. But like, if you just you could spend a night redoing the structure of the room and come out with something that's probably gonna feel a lot better. So that's more like. When I make it interiors, I copy them now almost straight off of like layouts from Victorian homes in this time. Got it. If you look at like some of the most, uh, what's his name? Uh, Boone Cotter that worked on, on Uncharted and his lighting scenes, like those rooms and those environments he's made, the structure of the plate, like if we remove all the props, it's the structure of the room, like it might have a, til a tilted or a slanted ceiling. Is it Cotter or Cutter? I can't remember. Me neither. There yeah, him. And on his art station, you have these apartment light, like he's lit these apartments or uh, these buildings, right? And like, uh, he doesn't have all of them. But either way, just thinking about like how you can make stuff that just looks more interesting just from the structure. You can see, if you look at this one right here, like how the roof is slanted here, or the ceiling, I mean. Mm -hmm. It's super interesting, generally. So it's like, it's worth taking the time, just making sure the structure of the interior is, is uh, already interesting by, by its basic shape. If you have a, a square room, 
the viewer or the player already knows what to expect when he walks into it. Hmm, interesting. So if you start like, you just take that corner edge, bevel it, it will already start adding some kind of interest to the space. And generally, unless you're super rich, rooms tend to be tight. Mm -hmm. And also bookcases, sometimes it's good to have bookcases that are like standing like they are here against the wall. Sometimes it's interesting to um, to embed the bookcase into the wall. So you make the you make sure the wall has thickness and the bookcase can be sh like shuffled into the wall. So it's like mm -hmm. embedded in the wall. Yeah. Then it makes like oh did, then then the room looks like oh this is uniquely designed for this bookcase rather than oh here's just a prop that's just been placed here. Got it. It adds to that visual interest and the uniqueness of the scene. I think Kyle, you did that on the other side, if I remember right. All right, maybe yeah. yeah. Okay. He's got a he's got in a whole other side that the oh I see. Okay. still developing that camera angle. All right, cool. This is awesome. And Matthew just uh, finished the boot camp, so this was the piece from that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah I, re I really like how it has it has like a clear focal point, but then it would probably uh, adding a symmetry probably would help. I can't really see what's going on with the ceiling if it's just flat with a hole in it. Mm -hmm. But people tend to underestimate how much a ceiling, a well-defined ceiling can elevate a piece. The same goes for the floor. The floor here is already great. It has interesting shapes happening, right? You kind of want to reflect complex shape in the ceiling as well. Like it might be too dark here on my monitor, but yeah, otherwise I really, I, yeah, I think it's, this is pretty cool. Yeah, and I think you, you've really understated the fog to Matthew. So that was, that was a good shift you made. Cool. All right. And one last from Oscar. So Oscar, he's done a couple of things, but these were the props that he developed early on. Mm -hmm. And uh, and then I haven't seen this one right now. So why don't we just look at your most recent one? It looks like something I've seen before from like Dead Space. Yeah, I'm not a weapon guy, so I can't really help that much with just weapons in particular. But I generally, from what I've heard, it's important to like, because now that we have procedural ways of adding wear and tear and grime. When that process is easier, you have to spend more time focusing on the logical locations where you put them. You know, where would the, the wear and tear naturally happen? AO map helps to some extent to get that, like where there naturally dirt and stuff occurs. But like, mm -hmm. since it has a handle for one, like it would be way more worn if the, cause it looks like a used weapon, right? Right. So the handle will be more worn than other places. The places where I'm not sure exactly how me like mechanically it works, but where it would reload and the metal parts would like rub up against each other would be more worn and maybe show some, if it was painted metal, it would show some of the, of the more like, like chipped away metal paint mm -hmm. uh, and stuff. So you kind of want to focus on, on that, but that stuff also that comes with experience in this case, like it's, yeah, I mean, making guns, it's tricky, man, because I've always been a big fan when you put, like, even people when making rifles, I remember some of the gun artists back in the day, they tended to just not make guns, but they would may put it in a tiny, tiny environment. They would like, okay, so this is a gun resting on a table, right? Put a light on it. They made a big fake, like, shadowy leaf texture that would mm -hmm. throw shadows on the ground that would be, like, moving a little bit. And just make a small scene, so it makes it like it makes the setting and tells a story just from the gun, and then just adding the personal stuff to the gun as well, like the personalization, like scratching your name on it. This is my gun. You mm. know, gun people, they uh, you know, they want to show off their own stuff. Got it. Yeah, and that's the same yeah, for see, this one. This, Put more scenes. This, yeah, this one has a couple of cool stuff on it. I think like the the scratching on the right there is super cool. I like yeah, I like that R a lot. R K was here. I forgot he put that there. <laughs> <laughs> that's really cool. Yeah, I, I, this is, yeah, I really like this one. Like, this has like a little bit, like you can see here on the left, like uh, it's a bit more scratch where like they put the thing in there all the time, which is really cool. I like that. The more stuff you can make sure like it looks like it's been, like it's also scuffed like on the side there to the left, which is really cool. That's basically what I'm talking about. Like if you can transfer a lot of, of that thinking into every prop you do, then then you're in a good position. But then the sad thing is that unless this is a hero prop, like in games, you don't want to make stuff looking too unique because then you can tell how repetitive everything is. Mm. <laughs> but but generally, you don't have to worry about that, though, for your portfolio piece. It's better that you know how to, to put the detail where you need it. Got it. But yeah, this is super cool. I really like the, the metals here as well. It's really nice. 
All right, Chris, man, thank you so much for taking time out of your day and sharing your your wisdom and for looking at the student work. That was really nice. Oh, no worries. No worries. Anytime. That's All right, guys. Day. Thank you so much. Have an awesome evening or uh, afternoon, wherever you are. And uh, Chris, have a good one, man. I look forward to chatting more. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. And if anybody has any questions, you can always contact oh. me on uh, Art yeah, Station. Let's, uh, let's get back and, to uh, Art Station. And I have a blog that I run as well. Outside of Art Station or on Art Station? No, it's on Art Station where I go through like development for UE4 stuff and my own project. And I tend to try and give back a lot of what the community has given me. So students, graduates, everybody just send questions if you have any. I'd be happy to answer any questions you have. About All right. Anything. Well, there you go. So Chris Radsby and uh, right there at Art Station, guys, you can see the link right here. Have All a right. good one. Cool. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Bye. All right. So I want to thank you so much for being here, for taking the time and for listening to this podcast. And I want to ask a couple of things from you. Number one, make sure you leave a comment or you rate this on iTunes, Stitcher, wherever it is that you're getting this. That's going to make a big difference in helping us get the word out and get people to know who we are. All right. The other thing is I want to make sure you know where to find us. So you can head over to www.gameartinstitute.com where you can learn about our flagship program, which is the Game Artist Boot Camp. This, this is designed for those who are really looking to move the needle on their career and really lock in that job. You may have gone to school and learned a bunch, maybe haven't learned a bunch. But at the Game Art Institute, the primary focus we have is the very specific industry skills, the triggers that you really need to hit in that job interview. What are the specific things that they're looking for? That's what we're going to be training you on. We're taking applications right now for environment artists and for character artists. So make sure you head over to www.gameartinstitute.com and apply today. That way we can have that conversation, make sure this is a fit for you, make sure that you're a fit for it. And if everything is perfect, then we will sign you up for that right away and get you into your training and start moving the needle on your career. All right, thank you so much again for being here. Take care, have an amazing day.